I now am, am very excited mm-hmm. to welcome yes. a new title to the Lapsed Bookshelf, boss. Ooh, 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 ooh. I wasn't expecting this. Yes, I know. One of the things I was really excited to realize, and I think a yes. one of our followers on Twitter may have pointed it out, yes. is that Survivor Series 88 is pretty much the last stand of the British Bulldogs. Yes, of course. Dynamite Kid and Davy Boy Smith. And I don't know if you know, but... Did Davy the... Boy write a, write a book recently? Dynamite Kid. Oh, not Davy Boy? No. I wish Davy Boy would write a book. He never... <laughs> Maybe Diana will. Okay. <laughs> This one will actually not be so libelous that it might be available for more than a week and a half. But I, get uh, it. I, I keep, you know, it's funny. I only remember to get that book when I'm when we're doing the show. I got to remember to get that book. I will fork over the like eighty dollars for it. It's more than that. that book. There's a, no, I saw it on Amazon for like 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 forty bucks. You will be my hero if you buy that book and if you can find the Gary Hart book. The oh yeah, Gary Hart book is ultra rare, but it's said to be excellent. I didn't get my hands on it when it came out. It's more of a book about Kind of like, almost like booking lessons and lessons of the industry and like rules of the road as opposed to just a biography, but Mm. uh, can't get my hands on it. So, um, yeah, it would be amazing. So, Dynamite Kid. Um, They're staring across the ring at the Rougeos and the aforementioned 10-man tag, and there is some lore. 10-tag tag. 10-tag tag. tag. (laughs) Doesn't sound right. Doesn't roll off the tongue. (laughs) 10-team tag. (laughs) Triple T. (laughs) Everybody here. So I need a bruise for this match. So, yes, there's a lot of backstory between these two teams, and they had a very famous backstage knockdown drag out fight. And I'm going to excerpt generously from Pure Dynamite, Dynamite Kid's um, autobiography, which is excellent and was kind of part of that very, very first vanguard of wrestling autobiographies in the late 90s. I. Don't get me wrong here. It came out almost exactly at the same time as Mick's first book, or even perhaps before it. Um, I remember it feeling so fresh to have such a an honest retelling of a wrestling career um, in your hands at that particular point in time. And since, of course, everybody's done books. But his was one of the first, of course, uh, wheelchair-bound somewhere, living in anonymity, I think in public housing in the UK somewhere, uh, with very little to show for it. Uh, Dynamite Kid, for all of his incredible gifts, um, was not um, much of a, of an interpersonal guy in terms of like keeping up uh, relations, um, mm-hmm. but it heads with just about everybody he came in contact with in the industry and kind of lays all that bare in the book as well. And the Rougeau certainly fit into that category, and it would kind of lay the groundwork for him to not only exit the WWF, but shortly wrestling altogether. And uh, this really puts you back in this time period, 88, WWF locker room kind of the personalities at play, what the what the circuit was like. So welcome to the Lapsed Fan Bookshelf, Pure Dynamite, wow. Tom Billington. Um, <clears throat> so let's be strategic here. Um, he's talking a bit about Kurt Angle. Pardon me, Kurt Angle. Fuck, no, he's not. Yeah, he's talking about a six-year-old named Kurt Angle. No, he's talking about <laughs> Kurt Hennig. <laughs> Kurt Hennig, who just come in, of course, right. was on the show. 39, 39.13 on Amazon. What what is? Diana Hart's book. Thirty nine dollars and thirteen cents. Yep, I'm going for it. You son of a bitch. I'm gonna do Are it. Are you sure? You sure you're not getting ripped off or there's some? Well, I mean, work? I mean, you never. I mean, let me see what the let me see actually what the guys. I know we're doing this totally. This is happening, folks. Like as we're doing this. Fuck. Let me go back and oh come on, stop being a That's bitch. That's gonna come. Okay, you, you you continue and I'll okay. and I'll. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. So Kurt Hennig's in. He's on this show. Pretty brand new, and the reason I mention that is because it explains. Yeah, but I'm, I'm going to interrupt the guy. The guy who sells it sells it has a 95 percent positive um, feedback. Buy it. I'm buying it. Buy the motherfucker. Look at that under the mat, right? Under the mat, the name of it with some oh, stupid ass pink letters. Yeah, I remember the pink letters. Yep, that's it. I'm I'm going to do it. But oh. I got along great with Kurt. Like me, he enjoyed a good prank. Dynamite writes, but when he Hennig, Hennig, yes sir. Hmm. But when he played one on the Rougeos, it backfired on me and turned into something a lot more serious. We were in Miami, Florida for a house show, and as I've already told you, leaving your clothes unattended while you were in the ring could be risky when certain people were about. A lot of wrestlers had got wise to this and had somebody watch out for their stuff while they were wrestling, and that was what the Rougeos did. They asked Kurt Hennig to keep an eye on their clothes. While they were gone, Kurt found a pair of scissors and cut their shirts and pants to ribbons. 
It had bulldog stamped all over it, so just before they got back, Kurt shot off into the toilet. They walked in, saw their clothes, and shouted for Kurt. He called back that he was on the toilet. So straight away... <laughs> I'm on the can, what? That Robbinsdale accent. I'm taking a shit! They put two and two together. <laughs> I don't know why he sounds like the guy who fucking, you know, always worried about the picket fences. <laughs> So, straight away, they put two and two together and made five. They decided that it was me and Davy Boy Smith. Bear in mind, I knew nothing about this because I wasn't even in the same dressing room. They started cursing us and saying things about what they were going to do to us, and sure enough, word soon got back to us that our names were mud with the Rougeaus. I still didn't know why at this point, so I thought, right. I walked next door into their dressing room where they all sat playing cards, and I'd met Jacques, had his back to me, but all I did was give him a flat hander straight across his ear. He jumped up and shouted, what are you fucking playing at, Dynamite? I'm sure he said that, Tom. It's a very British thing for this Montreal guy to say. What are you playing at? What the fuck are you doing? Then, <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a really good French-Canadian accent right there. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> I can smell the poutine on his breath. <laughs> then he turned and tried to dive at me, low, for a double leg. Okay, this is how he writes it. Then he turned and tried to dive at me, comma, low, comma, <laughs> just to be clear, for a double leg. But as he went down, I got on top of him, turned him over, and banged him twice in the face. <laughs> Jacques Rougeau. I picture this being the noise he makes when he gets hit in the face. Ah! 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 He goes, ah! He goes <laughs> <laughs> Fuck, fucker! <laughs> <Yes>! <laughs> <laughs> victimized for real son of a bitch <laughs> so, <laughs> okay um, so let's see okay Bane twice in the face then Raymond came over and tried to interfere he put his hand across saying dynamite stop Jacques has had enough I said, move your hand. This has nothing to do with you. He wouldn't move, so I... <laughs> he wouldn't move, so I knocked Raymond out. <laughs> Down goes Raymond Rougeau. Looking like a fucking game show host eating Ow. shit on a... Uh, hey, hey. <laughs> this is Ray Rougeau. No. Come on. Ow! <laughs> Just, no, he's out. Then he hits the ground fucking... <laughs> Done. <laughs> motionless like world star hip-hop video motionless so i knocked him out that's great okay all right where were we i keep losing my place <laughs> too much action going on i'd laid the rougeos flat out on the floor that should have been the end of it by mistake is, is, is he legit is, is is billington legit well we'll present a check on this story in just right. a moment you you know better than that you know i have I multiple know. sources know. that's true that's true Good call. <laughs> so down he goes um by mistake, they thought I'd cut their clothes up, which was no big deal because I'd done it to a lot of wrestlers, but Kurt Hennig later admitted it was him. So as far as I was concerned, we were straight. Two weeks later, we're in Fort Wayne, Indiana, to do a TV taping. I'd seen the Rougeos a few times since Miami, but they'd never said a word to me or Davey. Anyway, this day, in between taping their interviews, they were both quiet, reading a book, not talking, but reading, which I thought was a bit funny. TV taping sometimes took all day and all night. You could be taping interviews to go with matches for up to a month ahead. We broke for lunch, had something to eat, and then one by one, the wrestlers were called back for the next interviews. As usual, I was the last one out of the canteen. Davey went back ahead of me. I grabbed a cup of coffee, lit a cigarette, and started walking back down the corridor to the studio. Ahead of me, I could see the Rougeaus talking to Pat Patterson in the corridor. Jacques was leaning against one wall. Raymond was on the other, doing the talking. Mm -hmm. I had the cigarette in one hand, cup of coffee in the other, and as I got nearer, I remember thinking to myself, no, they're not going to do me here. Because Pat, who was the foreman, was there. Mm -hmm. yes. don't, don't get me wrong. If Pat hadn't been there, I would have approached them in a totally different manner. But I thought, no, I'll be all right here. And stepped through when, bang, Jacques smashed me in the mouth with a yes. nut duster. I heard the crunch as four teeth went there and then. My mouth was ripped to shreds inside and out. And there was blood mixed with pieces of gum just pouring down the front of me. That first shot had knocked me dizzy, but I still managed to think. Instinctively, I knew I couldn't go down, and I needed to back myself against the wall. Everything was a blur, and somewhere in the background I could hear Pat shouting, Stop! Stop! And then Jacques hit me again, maybe two or three times. I was ready to blast him back when I saw Ray out of the corner of my eye, about to blindside me. 
for that split second, I thought that was it. I'd had it. I couldn't take the two of them. Then I heard bad news Brown shout, What's going on? He'd heard the commotion and come out of the dressing room into the corridor. Bad news Brown saved my life. Wow. Because if he hadn't appeared when he did, I think they would have killed me. The Rougeaus didn't hang about. When they saw bad news, they took off like sprinters down the corridor and out of the building. What cowards? Bitch. Somebody else, I don't know who was shouting, dynamite's been done. By the way, uh, just to interrupt you for one second, do you yeah. want to know how depressing, though, the Gary Hart book situation is? What? There are nine There are nine options on, on Amazon, and they range from $250 oh, fuck me. to $7,500. Members of the solar system, you got to have a pirated copy for me. you got to have that PDF. Someone's got to have it somewhere. Do the right thing. Mm -hmm. Thelapsedfan at gmail.com. It didn't even come out that long ago. It's like, it's it's only, it came out in 2009. I know, I know. It's, why, what happened? Why is it not? The limited run, limited run. Did it just like tank? Like, did sales just suck? I don't know. I honestly don't know. I know there's been interest in republishing it, and I think the author has spoken to that, but I just, don't know why it got cut so short, but it's incredibly rare and incredibly good from what I hear. So do the right thing. Okay. So somebody else, I don't know who was shouting, dynamite's been done. I had to, I was a me- I was in a mess. Apparently the Rougeaus had left the building probably for the airport and gone straight back to Montreal. I started cleaning myself up. Pat Patterson came in the dressing room with some money. He said, here, go to the hospital, get yourself stitched up, but just tell them you've been in an accident. <laughs> Somebody drove him to the hospital. I can't even remember who. At the hospital, the doctor said, what happened to you? It must have looked bad. I still had my wrestling gear on. That's hilarious. So I told... One of those fucking blue tights with the Union Jack on it. So I told him that I'd been in the studio taping interviews for the wrestling, and I tripped over a cable and gone face first into some equipment. But I don't think he believed me because he said, you look as if you've been run over by a train. (laughs) Then he started... (laughs) stitching my mouth. I'd never had pain like that. My lips were torn open, and the inside of my mouth was in shreds. Four teeth had gone out. Smashed right out. I got back to the studio, and straight away Pat Patterson said, Vince wants to see you in his office. This was maybe an hour or so after the incident, so I went in, and I think he really was shocked when he saw the state I was in, but the first thing he said to me was, Goddamn, Tom, I can't believe you didn't go down. I said, no, I Jesus. didn't. Yeah, go ahead. The fucking... <laughs> oh, he's, like, he's kind of drunk, huh? He's had a little tipsy there. The I mean, I was... I, was, uh, huh. I kept telling him to beat the moron. You know, I said, make sure you take Tom out. I said, I want to see... I want to see Tom Billington dead on the floor. <laughs> he made sure to say he that kept... so that the guys that are, you know, so that the guys who are uh, listening to him on the wire have the exact quote they need to indict. I want to see Tom Billington dead on the floor. I want to make sure that Tom Billington is dead. I can see the quote right now in the indictment, in paragraph seven. I said, if you, Rougeau's, I'll pay you an extra 2,500 if he goes dead in two minutes. Each. Yep. Shit. (laughs) Wow. He says, wow, of all the things to say. What a non sequitur. It hasn't even happened yet. I'll pay you 2500 if he goes in two minutes. Shit. Wow. Why would you say wow? It, nothing's happened. They're still standing there in their fucking uh, uh, yellow and blue uh, spandex. Hmm. Just got excited. <laughs> Just got excited. <laughs> Just got excited. Boy, am I excited. It reminds me of Don King with WrestleMania 14. <laughs> so what, what does he have Vince actually saying? After Billington told him, I'm going to sort these two pricks out, he said, no, don't do that. They might call somebody. <laughs> just let them be. They, they, they don't just, it was a prank. All in good fun. Well, by hell, Vince, I've been not very good fun for me. You take a look at my fucking lip. You don't oh. go for fucking bloody, bloody fun much, I mean, do, do you? I mean, Tom, you're you're a wrestler. 
You know, wrestlers, you know, rib each other. They, they're, they're fucking with you. You are so fucking rib, Vince. You I can tell a, you right now. <laughs> you called us a rib. <laughs> I said I was going to pull a rib before, and Bad News wanted a half rack. <laughs> I can tell you right now, Tom. I had nothing to do with it. <laughs> Vince immediately starts shifting into legal mode. He's immediately covering his ass. He's immediately thinking about statute. <laughs> I love when Vince has this, this sudden realization. It all synthesizes like, oh shit, my back's against the wall. I could be entrapped right here. <laughs> I have to immediately state my innocence to this guy who can't even talk. Just <laughs> like out of nowhere, with right. no more, just like completely like indicting himself, basically. Well, he's by so, saying that he's so paranoid that he's gonna get caught because now he sees how fucked up he is. That <laughs> he he hears in what Dynamite's saying hints that Dynamite knows what's going on. Like he freaks yeah. himself out so much that he like. <laughs> He, he imposes, he superimposes on Dynamite's words hints that somehow he knows he was in on it. So all of a sudden he offers, I had nothing to do with this, I just want you to know. And Billington's like, what the fuck, Vince, I didn't get anything to do with it. Well, Talk good, because that is the truth. That is the absolute truth. I am clean of this. <laughs> Let's be clear. Jerry McDevitt's like, whoa, 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 Vince. Please finish that sentence. <laughs> the feds are out in the van listening right now. Tapes rolling. They're smoking cigars while they listen. Yeah. So, so you just get better. And uh, I'll make sure this never happens again. Here's what he actually said. After he said they might call somebody, Billington writes, he was being serious. They knew people in Montreal who could see me off. But he said... Leave this with me, and I'll sort something out. Well, I knew my teeth were going to cost something to fix. I came out of Vince's office and went to get changed. He told me I couldn't wrestle that night. But it was only later that I thought about what he'd said. He hadn't been there. He hadn't seen it. But he knew I hadn't gone down. In fact, he couldn't believe I hadn't gone down. That was when I thought, what was I supposed to have done? But at that point, I didn't give it much thought. And I didn't get much of a rest, because the next day we had to fly up to LaGuardia Airport in New York to catch the Red Eye Special to France. The WWF had a 10-day tour of France and Italy. That next morning was the first time I'd seen Davey since the incident with the Rougeaus. He told me he'd call his family in Goulburn in Lancashire, I imagined, to tell them what had happened. But what he actually told them was, only for me, the Rougeaus would have... If only for me, the Rougeaus would have killed Tommy. <laughs> he really buries Bulldog something vicious in this book. So this went all around our hometown. Thomas got a good hiding, and David saved him. He was the <laughs> hero. I was the piece of shit. He was clean. I was taking drugs and was probably going to die soon anyway. Bear in mind, it was only later that I found all this out, but that was my cousin. In my opinion, you always look after your family no matter what. That was something I'd always believed. I still do. I couldn't understand why Davy Boy Smith didn't feel the same way. By rights, the Rougeaus should have been fired there and then. All the wrestlers who went on the European tour seemed certain they would be, and I knew wrestlers who'd been fired for less. But the next morning, after I'd had time to think about it, I was having my doubts. In fact, I was convinced that Pat Patterson knew, or at least had an idea, that something was going down. Why else would Jacques jump me right in front of the foreman? And because of what he'd said, I wasn't even sure about Vince. Look at that. Comes full circle. You were dead mm -hmm. on with your instinct there. It's funny. To this day, I still wonder if he knew I'd been set up. So I you love gonna... when that happens. Yes. Oh, it makes me so electrified because it, <laughs> it shows that actually our, our imitations, our sense of these guys comes from a, a reality, a reality. It, it stems from it. We, we think we've separated the characters so much, but there is a fundamental they're, building blocks that come from what we know somewhere in our subconscious about these guys. We've they're heard. not as lapped as we think they are. <laughs> That's correct. <laughs> Why else would Jock? Okay. Um, so as you can imagine, I was feeling pretty bad, mentally as well as physically. Oh, I was sore. But in one way, I was glad to be on that European tour because it meant at the end of it, I could stop off at home for a week to see my dad. Okay, he goes back and forth about this, talks about how they, uh, the kind of television clearances they had in France. He wrestled Valentine in a singles match, blah, blah, blah. Okay. Um, talked about the different styles he worked on the tour. Davy Boy Smith. 
They go to the hotel room. Nick Bockwinkle is there for some fucking reason. Oh, he was the agent at the time. He's working for Vince. That's right. Wow. Yep. Yep. He had a very short. I never knew that happened. Very short lived run as an agent. Um, <clears throat> so we're talking about Don Morocco. Blah, blah, blah. Uh, let's see. <clears throat> <laughs> Um, the tour finished and while everybody went back to America or to Canada, I flew back to England, spent a week at home in Goldburn with my dad, who I still missed in spite of being away all those years. When I arrived back in New York, ready for the start of the next tour, the Rougeaus were still on my mind. It turned out they hadn't been fired or suspended. That hadn't even been, they hadn't even been fined. Instead, it was Don Morocco and the Junkyard Dog who were fired for their behavior on the tour. Mm -hmm. Talks about that. Um, they'd both been reported to Vince, who called him to his office in Stamford. He asked Don, who had no idea what was coming, how the tour had gone. Don said, fine. Then Vince told him he was fired. <laughs> Don said, what for? Vince replied, I can't have wrestlers talking to my agents like that because if one starts, they'll all start, which I thought made us all sound yeah. like little kids. Hey, uh, Morocco, how you doing? Oh, the dude. oh, everything's good, brother. Good. You're fired. Fucking brick. What, what, what I, Vince, what did I do, bro? Because I want to... You didn't do anything. You just need to get fired because I'm thinking long term and you're not there. I've got another guy coming in in about eight years or so. He's going to be the rock. Not you. <laughs> Fucking Johnson's kid. Yep. You know? He's, gonna, he's got that kid Dwayne. Mm -hmm. Big star. You're not. And Get that, the fuck out. You're fired here in 88 because in 96, I'm going to bring in Rocky Johnson's kid and call him the rock eventually. In 10 years. I want now. as much diff distance between him, who is talented and trustworthy and got talent, and you, who are nothing. You are a nothing. Yes. You are a fat yes. muscle head yes. who deserves. Nothing less than humiliation. <laughs> Vince lets him down easy, doesn't he? Nice and gently. Nice smooth landing. Um, and don't try getting work here at other places in, in the States. Ain't gonna happen. <laughs> Understand? Okay, Vince. I appreciate in the opportunity. Preparation, shut up. In preparation for this, I have called every promoter and I have said that Don Morocco hunts children. <laughs> hunts children. You're untouchable, you fucker. <laughs> so it went well, needless to say. The remark that set him off, by the way, the whole situation, it was basically he was imitating Nick Bockwinkle while drunk backstage at a show. Nick overheard him, and Nick kind of was a good-humored fellow. He was listening to it, and he was also very much like a... He was very much like um, one of those guys that would correct your English, you know. It wasn't just his, yeah, it wasn't just his gimmick. Okay. That was his. And so uh, Morocco, going on and on, pretending to be Bachwinkle, says something that was inaccurate about when and how Bachwinkle had the AWA title, and he corrects him. And yes. Don comes back at him. What the fuck would you know? I've drawn more people than you ever could. Yes. So gone. Can't have. Oh my God! Did he really think that, dude? Did Morocco really think that? I think he did. I think he did. An idiot. But there was still the matter of myself and the Rougeos to, to sort out, Dynamite writes. <laughs> About a week after I'd come back from England, Vince called to say he'd arranged a meeting for me, myself, and the Rougeos. It was in a private room at a hotel in California. I think Vince and maybe the Rougeos were hoping to resolve it by leaving things as they were, but not me. I said to Vince, I'm leaving. Fuck all. They can pay for these teeth to be fixed. Then I'll leave it. Jacques started getting angry and said he wasn't going to pay, but Ray cut in. He told Jacques to, shut the fuck up. He turned around to me and said, get the bill for your teeth from your dentist and let us have it. We'll pay it. That's the end of it. So I did. I got a dentist bill for about $1,800 and gave it to them. And the Rougeaus paid, but it wasn't my bill. I had my teeth fixed for nothing. It was as well that things were settled between us. <laughs> okay, I get it. His teeth had been fixed for free and he worked him to pay him $1,800. That's nice. Oh, funny. <laughs> it was as well that things were settled between us because the next thing we knew... We were wrestling each other at the Survivor Series. Oh, boy. Which was coming up at the end of November. 
They were jostling for room at the top of the card now. Hulk Hogan, Randy Savage, who was the champion and the ultimate warrior, they all wanted to be the main man. There were a few new faces in the WWF as well, one of which was Bret Hart's younger brother, Owen. Since the age of 12 or 13, Owen had been working hard in Stu's gym in Calgary. For the last year or so, he'd been wrestling for Stampede, and for a couple of months that year, he'd been the IWGP Junior Heavyweight Champion for New Japan. So he was ready for the big time. I don't know for sure, but I would imagine Bret put a word in for him with the office, and I wasn't surprised when they hired him. Owen was a good wrestler, very agile, and a hard worker. But when they first brought him in, Vince told him he would be wrestling in a mask. He said to him, think of a name for yourself. So Owen, trying to make himself look great before he was even working, came up with the American e Eagle. He told Vince, I want yeah. to be the American Eagle. Well, that's fucking stupid. What? Look, you gotta wrestle with a mask. You're fucking ugly. I mean, look, all the hearts are fucking ugly. You're pretty fucking... I mean, you, you don't have a crease in your nose. It's just just the worst. Mm. Wear a fucking mask. You're not going to be the American Eagle. That just sounds stupid. Mm. Nobody likes American Eagles. Maybe, maybe you can be Aeropostale. Maybe. Um, I mean, uh, what about um, mm. oh, being a, 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 a comic book guy? You like comics? You read comics? Yeah. No, you do? Oh, good. Well, who's your favorite comic book guy? Um, I know. How about the Blue Blazer? <laughs> He's my favorite. Why don't you be him? Patterson. No, it's Patterson. What? Fuck in here. what? Um, is there a comic book about a, the Blue Blazer? Do you know? The Blue Blazer? Yeah. No, I don't know. But I know Boo Berry. Get the fuck out of here. You <laughs> we'll see you later. Stupid ass clown. <laughs> All right, so there's no Blue Blazer, but you're going to be the Blue Blazer. Yeah. So you are the original superhero. Dude, listen to me. Yeah. Listen to me. The next line in this book. You ready? Oh, yes. But Vince said that was no good and told him he was going to be the Blue Blazer. <clears throat> I shit you not, that's what it says. You have no knowledge. Let the audience know. No knowledge. I've never what's read fucking Billington's book. He had the blue mask, the cape, and the feathers. Well, he looked like a bloody parrot going to the ring, but... <laughs> He looked good as a wrestler as in the aerial moves, the back somersaults off the top rope, and later on when he got rid of the mask and wrestled as Plano and Hardy formed a tag team with Coco Beware. Vince had a thing about... Uh, the... no. I mean, high energy. But after he was part of the new foundation... Well, he didn't say that... He didn't exclude that as a possibility. He just said that later he teamed with Coco, which is true. It's he... implying that that was the first thing he I did. I disagree. I disagree. He doesn't say next he teamed with Coco. Vince had a thing about big men, that was for sure, whether they were big, well-muscled men or just yeah. big, fat buggers. Oh, yeah. As long as they're giant fuckers. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm. Big, fat, big, muscular, whatever. Just As long as they got a good set of traps. <laughs> Vince had brought a new tag the team in delts. that month. The Brain Busters, Arn Anderson and Tully Blanchard, managed by Bobby Enon. They were a good team, and they'd done okay for themselves in the NWA as the tag champions, but in my opinion... Most... Okay. <laughs> Not feeling it. Uh, <laughs> I guess. Okay, Mr. Bean. But in my opinion... <laughs> But in my opinion, most of their success was down Arn Anderson. He was a good, solid wrestler, and he was a great heel. Tully, in my opinion, was full of shit. <laughs> That's great. Someone who thinks Telly Blanchard is full of shit. What a unique perspective. But apart from that, I think Vince had plans for the Brain Busters, and somewhere along the way, they involved the British Bulldogs, or they would have done it, or they would have done if it wasn't for something that happened in early November. The WWF tag team ranks were strong. Business was great. I couldn't say for certain, but I probably earned more money that year than any other with the pay-per-views, the house shows, and the royalties and everything. But like most people, I still had my principles. We were in Chicago one night, the last night of a three-week tour. As usual, right after the matches, Chief J was handing out the plane tickets for the flight to Syracuse and then the connecting flight home. The WWF always paid for the air tickets. The wrestlers paid for cars and hotels. When I went to get mine and Davies tickets, Chief J told me there were none left. I said, out. why's that? He said he didn't know, and I think he was telling the truth. I also think the reason why we didn't have any plane tickets might have been a punishment, a slap on the wrist for something we'd done, but at that point there was nothing the chief could do, which left us with a 200-mile drive to Syracuse before we could get back to Calgary. <clears throat> I was mad, well, we both were, because we were the only ones who didn't have a ticket. In fact, I was mad enough to have quit, just walked out there and then, which I knew would have been a stupid thing to do. But by the time we got back to the hotel to pick our stuff up, my mind was made up. I picked up the phone and put in an overseas call to Tokyo. So he calls uh, Giant Bob, his wife, looking to go to all Japan. 
Talks about that. And um, I asked for a job for him and Davy Boy. They said, when can you come? So that is kicking off. They wanted to, mm -hmm. them to come in in early 89. And he continues <clears throat> as we wrap up here from Davy Boy. Pardon me, from Dynamite. <laughs> We handed our notice in a couple of weeks before the Survivor Series, which was to be our last night that, of course, this Survivor Series we're discussing. I thought we might as well go out in a big show with a big paycheck. When Vince heard what we'd done, he didn't really say anything. I don't think it was because he didn't care. I'm sure he didn't want us to go. But I think he was confident that within a couple of weeks we'd be back. For example, on one of the last nights before we finished, we were wrestling the Brain Busters in Columbus, Ohio. Pat told us in the dressing room that the Brain Busters were going over via, via pinfall. I told him they definitely weren't. <laughs> what? Pat said, what do you mean? Do you really think they're going to beat me or my partner, one, two, three, in that ring? Pat said, that's right, Dynamite. I said, I'll tell you what will happen. They might count us out, or they might disqualify us, but there is no way those two are going to pin me or Davy Boy Smith. So then he got on the phone, complaining about me to Vince. Dynamite says he'll do this. Dynamite says he won't do that. Vince just said, tell Tom to do whatever he wants in the ring. So I went into the ring, and I wow. pulled down my trunks, and I took a shit. No, he didn't do that. That would have been amazing. Considering we were leaving anyway, plus Vince was wanting to push the brain busters, it wasn't what you would expect him to say, but I think the reason he said it was because he was sure I'd be giving him a call in a couple of weeks saying, I've made a mistake, can I come back? So Pat came back with Vince's message, go out and do whatever you feel like doing, and I did. The Bulldogs were disqualified. Mm. The second annual Survivor Series was at the Richfield Coliseum in Ohio again. We teamed up with the Rockers, the Hart Foundation, the Young Stallions, and the Powers of Pain to wrestle the Rougeaus, the Brain Busters, Demolition, Los Conquistadors, and the Bolsheviks. Mm -hmm. Walking down a WWF aisle for the last time as the British Bulldogs, maybe I should have felt a bit sad or emotional, but I didn't. I felt great. I'll be honest, I didn't even need that last match. If Vince had said to us, here boys, here's your 20 grand, it's your last night, you don't need to work. Not that he would have said that in a million years. <laughs> I'd have taken the money and gone. Me to shoot. <laughs> hey, I said you need to work. Where are you going? Where are you going? That doesn't <laughs> mean you can leave. have the night off. Mm -hmm. I said you need to work. You need to go out there and you're going to do a shoot match. Go out there and have a real fight. I don't fucking care with you. you can pick up members of the crowd if you want. Just yeah, do a brass knuckles thing against the Rougeaus. We can have fight a them. West Side Story the fight. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't give a shit. The bottom line is. I'm paying to watch you get your ass kicked. Yeah, bottom line is, fuck Billington. someone up. The dynamite up your ass, kid. Mm -hmm. You got that watch right. Watch that fucking fuse go and watch you explode on painkillers and crippling maneuvers. I hate you. Yes. I hate you, Tom Billington. You stupid Brit bitch. Oh, shit. Why don't you Brexit my company? Why don't you why don't you Brexit stage left? Why don't you Brexit life? <laughs> it was going to be an interesting match for the simple reason there was the chance we might up in the ring with the Rougeaus. As it was our last night for the WWF, who knows what could have happened, but it didn't work out like that. Five minutes into the match, Bret Hart let them off the hook by pinning Shock and eliminating them from the match, and they were out of that ring like a shot. <laughs> <laughs> Bitches. <laughs> We stayed in until close to the end of the match when Smash caught me and caught me out and eliminated the Bulldogs. When we got back in the dressing room, there was no sign of the yeah, Rougeaus. It's funny. It's funny that because I really thought they were. I thought they would be. Um, it, now thinking about the match, I thought if they were being phased out, they would have been one of the early teams eliminated. But mm -hmm. they stayed to the end almost. Yeah, they did. Yeah, they got substantial time in. Um, but when we got there, no sign of the Rougeaus. When we got back to the dressing room, they were long gone. I said to Pat Patterson. That was a short one, wasn't it, Pat? He didn't say a word. There was just one thing left for us to do before we had a last drink in the hotel bar. We had to give Matilda back to Vince. That mm. dog had flown thousands of miles with us and chased our opponents across more rings than I could remember. I'll be honest, I'd never really cared much for her one way or the other. She was more Davy's dog than mine. But as our mascot, I thought Matilda... She's not your dog. I She's a rental. You. Oh, and I want her Long back. back. I want my goddamn dog back. She's my British Bulldog. You're a shit. You don't get anything. You don't get any more money. You don't get any more life. You sure as fuck don't get my dog. Vince I hate you. shook our hands, saying all the best and see you soon. 
In four years, we must... I wish you luck in your future endeavors. In four years, we must have caused enough trouble to have been fired a few times over, but I was pleased that we left on good terms with no hard feelings. Dynamite Kid on the lapsed fan. Wow.